Hello and welcome back to MentalMMA.com. This is James McNeil here at MentalMMA.com. Remember, it is our goal to be your information source for the mental game of mixed martial arts. I want to talk about UFC 111. Very exciting card, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Before I go into the actual things, I want to do a couple of promos for the UFC. Why? Because I'm a nice guy. Number one, we went to see it in a movie theater. <clears throat> Never done that before. Didn't know what to expect. I got to tell you, it was a blast. Giant auditorium, people screaming, 60 feet fighters, high definition, great audio. The crowd could yell and scream, and I'm still hearing every single sound. I'm seeing things with, with greater um, clarity and focus than in any other way of watching the fights. When you go to the fights live, if you've been, you know that it's difficult to really see what's going on. But in a movie theater, the ultimate UFC experience. Sorry for those of you who don't like me doing a plug, but my goodness, it was a great way to watch the fights. I don't think I'm, I'm going to do it any other way if I can help it. Really good fun. Next, funny little magazine, UFC magazine, Chuck Liddell, great sense of humor. And uh, the thing you really got to focus on is his t-shirts in this one. Great stuff. Also, I'm going to learn a little bit more about the gambling side of fighting because, as you may know, if you're tracking with me, I am predicting correctly so often. I was 100% in my predictions, and uh, so I'm going to learn a little bit about gambling. Not because I plan on gambling, but because it appears gamblers are watching and listening. So hopefully I'll be able to speak your language soon. Again, I am 100% on my prediction, so I want to talk about the fights, talk about how they played out, <clears throat> and uh, see if I can bring some clarity as to why. Okay, UFC 111. Um, I think what I might do is, is start right at the top. So the George St. Pierre and uh, Dan Hardy fight. I wanted to talk about the fact that GSP openly discussed his fear. He talked about he's afraid um, of losing. He's afraid of, of getting, getting hit. And, um, and a lot of fighters don't do that. And I think there's a healthy point to that. I think there's something very, very wise. GSP says, look, I'm not afraid as in I can't do it. I'm afraid that if I'm not on my game, I won't do it. He knows that anyone can lose to anyone, and he knows that things could go badly. And he respects his competitor. And with that kind of healthy level of fear, he seems to be able to have uh, crystalline focus. Now, the challenge with the fear, if you may have noticed, he's always listened to Greg Jackson. He's always been very obedient, if you know what I mean. They have a great relationship. And so when Greg Jackson yells out commands or talks to him between rounds, GSP um, does exactly what he's told. <clears throat> On this one, he had some trouble doing it. I think he, there's a couple of, couple of factors. GSP has mastered the fine art of completely controlling and smothering his opponent and therefore limiting any possibility of being struck himself. The game plan was not to stand and strike with Dan Hardy. That makes sense because Dan Hardy knocks people out, or could. And GSP in the post-fight interview said, no, I actually think I'm a better striker than him, but why play the odds that way? The odds are so in my favor on the ground, why would I stand and strike? Makes sense to me, makes sense to anyone. However, when he was on the ground, his job was ground and pound. Greg Jackson wanted him to posture up, <clears throat> ring down strikes. And GSP was doing that, but he didn't like the lack of control. Even though it's on the ground, he found Dan Hardy was wiggling and, and getting his feet up and kind of striking back. And even though GSP was not getting hurt, that triggered those fear feelings of, there is a possibility of me getting hurt this way. Let me go back to total control and let me go for a safe submission. Uh, safe for him, not safe for Dan Hardy. So the fear factor, just so, so you know, that, that's very healthy. It gives us a healthy sense of, uh, sorry, it gives an MMA fighter a healthy sense of awareness and focus. But uh, in this case, it did keep GSP from having the more entertaining fight, which is what his, his uh, game plan was and what Greg Jackson was saying. On that note, by the way, Henzo Gracie, when GSP trained with Henzo Gracie, I actually heard Henzo say, stop going for strikes, stop posturing up, stay control, keep control of your opponent. So he had uh, some voices in his head, which were combating, and that caused some tension during the fight. Anyways, no shock, it was an amazing fight. Dan Hardy was really, really uh, tough and strong stronger than I thought, and uh, showed a lot of great stuff. He just was, he had nothing as far as takedown defense, nothing that we saw. Not that anyone can actually stop GSP, but um, it was it was, a, it was an interesting fight for those of us who are into the sport, uh, not as entertaining for those who don't understand the sport, but uh, there you go. So the fear factor that GSP brought into it was healthy. Let's move on to Shane Carwin and Frank Mir, because the next major point I have on the fights is focus. 
Now, fear drove the focus for GSP. When you look at the Frank Mir and Shane Carwin thing, Shane Carwin didn't seem to have fear. He didn't seem to be distracted. He was very focused. Frank Mir, on the other hand, was distracted, in my opinion. I don't know what was going on inside of his head, but you do recall that he had made those comments about Brock Lesnar. He wants to break his neck. He hopes he dies um, from injuries sustained in the cage. Then he came back and was incredibly respectful, incredibly uh, gentle in his comments to the media, talking about this is a safe sport, we're all honorable and respectful here, and everything's okay, and my family doesn't have to worry about my health, because they know I'm going to be fine. And so he really changed his tune, made some major shifts in how he was communicating. I don't know if that distracted him. His, 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 um, his, 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 focus on Brock Lesnar, although he talked in the media and said, no, 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 he's just another fighter. Maybe we'll fight, maybe we won't. He, he was talking that game, but I'm not sure if he bought it himself. I do think he was, he was lacking focus on the task at hand, which was Shane Carwin. Moments before the fight, notice this, that moments before they started the fight, they showed Brock Lesnar on the big screen. And I wish I could get a close-up on Frank Mir's face and on Shane Carwin's face, because I bet Shane Carwin barely glanced at it, and Frank Mir emotionally, I bet you his heart rate jumped. I bet you he had an adrenaline dump right there. There, looking at, at Brock Lesnar and being focused on the next fight, not the fight he was in. And uh, that's all at this, at this level that it takes to be defocused and to have some trouble. Also, I'm not sure that Frank uh, Mir had a healthy enough sense of fear for Shane Carwin. And uh, Shane Carwin, wow, what, what an amazing fight and what amazing uh, fists. My goodness, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but he does have the largest fists in MMA. His are 4X, I believe it is, the gloves. And Brock Lesnar, they had to make new gloves for Brock Lesnar because no one had hands that big. He has triple X, and then Shane Carwin came along. They had to make four X. So he's got, he, he throws cinder blocks, and we saw how fast he can throw them. Uh, my prediction uh, was for Shane Carwin, but I did say I'm not sure how fast his hands can be at 35 years old. Turns out they're plenty fast. And also, very wise that he didn't go, go into the open waters of striking. He went to the, the dirty boxing up against the cage, push him up against the cage, use his wrestling capacity to control Frank Mir and not allow Frank to use his, his out in the wide open striking capacity. So brilliant game plan, no shock. He's, he's, he's tapped into the Greg Jackson genius. Um, and so, great, great fight. Okay, so those are two great things. Per, Kurt Pellegrino, another amazing uh, fighter. I don't think I actually went as far as predicting him to win. I think I said I like him to win. I, 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 I'm, I'm encouraged, but he did win, and boy, did he look good. Uh, surviving the early onslaught from uh, Fabricio Camoes. Camoes? I think I'm, hopefully I said that right. But a beautiful uh, comeback, survival, and win. John Fitch, Ben Saunders. Uh, sadly, I, I didn't see this as a shocking win. Um, I feel bad for John Fitch in a couple of ways. I do want to see him fight uh, Tiago Alves, and I do want to see the winner of that get a title shot. Um, so Ben Saunders, good guy, good attitude. He came in there and tried, so just didn't have what it took at that level. Jim Miller, Mark Bocek, unanimous decision. That could have went either way. Um, maybe because I'm Canadian, I was rooting for uh, Mark Bocek. I thought he won. Everyone in the theater thought he won. Um, but great fight. Both of them looked great. They're going to have a great future.